He has wiped out by his grace through faith in Christ your every sin, every sin, past, present, future. Christian hedonist is somebody who says that my greatest joy, my greatest good is God. And therefore, I will pursue that joy and I will pursue that God above all else. So God's glorified and I'm satisfied. You are now listening to the Pastor Discussions Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 82 of the Pastor Discussions Podcast. I'm John. And I'm Joe. And this is your weekly conversation on doctrine, faith, and the Christian life. It is hot. It's, yes, Bro, it is hot. It is not even like... We have a... It's like I'm you walk sure. outside and you feel like you just want to wither up and <laughs> die kind of hot right now. It's the humidity. Well, it's also 100 degrees. Yeah, that's, that's so, true, But too. then you add the humidity and you've got a heat index of... 115. So. Give me dry heat, baby. I'll take dry heat any day. <laughs> well, that gets hot too. So yeah, but it's just it, it just feels like so like you walk outside and the air is so heavy. It's just like well, it's because everybody's run their pivot right now. If you're a farmer in Nebraska, for the good of myself, no. stop running your pivot. <laughs> they they've got to feed their crops. So. <laughs> uh, it's hot. Yeah, it is and hot. It doesn't rain in it the doesn't. summer. Here. Yeah. So, so not, there was a nice breeze a little bit though, a little hot breeze blowing hot on. Breeze. Yeah, like hot breezes are not nice. Five degrees cooler than the hundred degrees. So ninety five degree breeze on a hundred degree day feels pretty feels bad. Yeah. Feels just as bad. <laughs> and it's like, the, it's like uh Satan is blowing on you. Yeah. He's like <sighs> <laughs> And then on top of that the air conditioners. It's it's still goofy. working, but it's just not it's keeping like up. So I don't know if it has to do with just the intense heat uh or if there's something else wrong i don't know it's never had trouble before though first world problems people <laughs> oh, yeah. ministry in america we, shouldn't be complaining. It's, it's we, hard. we sit in an office there's plenty of guys that don't get to do that yeah so. well and and the heat is just a reminder of the heat of hell so <laughs> your need for christ is accentuated in summertime <laughs> do you think that's nah, let's not go down that road. <laughs> I'm not going to go say, into that. I was going to say, do you think uh, hell's actually going to be hot? Or I do. You do? I do. It's going to be burning, but never burn. That'd be horrible. Can you think about that? Maybe that's just a, there's going to be eternal torment. I know that. Yeah, but eternal conscious torment. Right. But that's the realization of the separation from God. Um, I think there's going to be physical torment. I think it's going to be like torture, torture, like Vietnam torture nonstop for eternity. <laughs> So, so now you're going to, you're, you're a literalist now, huh? <laughs> I don't know. I think that there's enough texts that, that talk about it in those, in those terms that the, the conscious torment of the wrath of God being poured out on you for eternity. Um, yeah. But that's not our topic for today. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do that some other time. Maybe we can, we can ask uh, Stephen episode. Anderson to come on. Hey, yeah. Steve Anderson. That'd yeah. be great. If you if, don't Google him. If you're listening and, or maybe just Google him for comedic. Like, yeah. Don't take him seriously. Sorry, no. He's horrible. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's, let's talk about what, <laughs> this is the worst intro ever. <laughs> I think it's a good one. <laughs> we got a Steven Anderson, uh, mention in there. So that's Oh good. man. Uh, so yeah, so we've got, um, we can get back on track here. We're part of, part of the bar podcast network. You can find out more about them and great, get, Get great biblical content for your ear holes at thebarpodcast.com and go check out, like we say it every week, but we're serious. Resurrection Coffee Co. is legit coffee. Um, and I'm just going to say it, like we haven't agreed to anything yet. We've been talking with uh, with uh, set Joel a set a case. Yeah. When he introduced himself to me, he was like, my name is set a case, like set a case down. <laughs> All right, thanks, man. Didn't need that part. <laughs> so uh, you know, it's not a bad idea when you've got a hard last name, like. Set a case or Habgawaks. We still can't say it. It's Habgawaks. Habgawaks. <laughs> Donnie, I'm sorry. I just call so, you Donnie. Yeah. It's just Donnie. Like you, you should come up with one of those like little things to help people remember it. And say it right. <laughs> yeah. So. so anyway, uh, Joel has a podcast on apologetics and uh, we'll link it in the show notes for you. But um, we had him on the show to talk apologetics and that was a lot of fun. We've been kicking around having him on or him having us on or something like that. So, uh, he's a, he's a good dude, uh, up in Chicago too, which Dave and in resurrection coffee made me think about it because they're in Chicago also. So anyway, worst intro ever. We're done with that. Let's talk 
Uh, now, now it's time for our worst episode. Yeah, worst episode. We keep, we've had, we've had worse. I said in a while. So oh, I, okay. I didn't say yeah. ever. I just yeah, said in true. a while. In a while. That's true. You can't keep up this, this level of quality forever. <laughs> Eventually yeah. it just breaks down. <laughs> I guess 80 episodes was our max limit. So now yeah, after, just, after 80, it just sort of goes downhill, I guess. I don't know. Uh, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about, uh, principles for ministry. That's sort of what we're calling this. Um, and it has broad application to the church in general and narrower application to us as individuals. So, uh, so we've had a lot of conversations, um, here lately and, and really over the last, we've talked about this since really, I think the first time it came up was at the, um, Converge conference. That we did. Uh, yeah. It, At least when we started articulating it. Yeah. We've way. been kicking it around and so, sort of developing it. So one of the things, one of the ways in which um, we do leadership is pretty hands off. Like we want to give people freedom to use their gifts and do um, what they're, what God's gifted them to do. And uh, we call it the oversight equipping model. <laughs> we'll call it whatever you want. Uh, basically we've talked about three principles and, and those three principles in Every ministry that we want to see is uh, gospel centrality, number one, um, simplicity, and excellence. That's two and three. Yes. So there's three of them. Yeah. One, two, three. Yes. So, uh, and so with those three things, now I I would say, I think gospel centrality is primary and then simplicity and excellence are your secondary things, but all, all three are important. But we've been emphasizing this now um, with different ministries with the ministries with the people direction um, and l- giving them freedom to work within that. But it w- I just use the gifts and yeah, yeah, everything that we do is we want, we want to be centered around the message of the gospel. We believe that it has the power to transform and to conform people who have been transformed uh, into the image of Christ. So mm. we <laughs> preach, we need, uh, unbelievers need the gospel and believers need the gospel True. Uh, on a regular basis. So a steady diet of the gospel. Yeah, we want our people to have a steady diet of the gospel, not at the exclusion of other things, but in addition to other things. Right. So when you're, when you talk about um, honoring your mother and father, there's a gospel principle. There's a, there's a pointer in there that points you to the reality of the gospel that gives, gives the power that spirit works through that to change people. Um, to and give them a greater desire to do those things because that's what honors Christ and honors yeah. God and gives God glory. So the gospel centrality has got to be something that we have in every ministry, structured ministry uh, within our church. Um, and then we've been talking about these two other things of simplicity and excellence because I think the church has gotten, and this doesn't um, necessarily apply to our context, but I would say the church broadly has gotten pulled into Bigger is better. Mm-hmm. Uh, more flash is going to get more people. Yep. Um, so it becomes this huge complex thing. It's a competition to right. And yeah. and what inevitably winds up happening is the churches that have more money or the that has more time or more volunteers can do more staff. It, right. Yeah. Can do it better Whatever. because they have the time uh, to put into these complicated um, shindigs that get put on in. I think a lot of the churches look at that model that are smaller and say, okay, I want to, I'm going to try to do that and follow suit. And what winds up happening is you get something that's extremely complex that's done really poorly. Mm-hmm. Um, and both those things, um, they don't reflect uh, our value of valuing the gospel and valuing Christ and, and valuing God as our supreme treasure, nor do, and they actually, they, I think they put people off um, because it's it can be done so poorly and ineffectively. So I think churches have gotten drug into this idea that to um, get people in the doors is kind of that seeker sensitive consumer mentality, and what comes with that is complicated schemes um, that are hard, and it's hard to do those um, big things well. Yeah, I think also the the relationship between simplicity and excellence to gospel centrality is really important too, because if we're doing really complicated Uh, over the top things, or uh, we're not doing things with excellence, what ends up happening is it detracts from the message of the gospel and can be a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
uh, a hindrance, a hindrance or a distraction, a barrier, a barrier. Yeah. So like, um, so rather than the gospel being what transforms and what encourages and what builds up, it's, I come for the quality of this or the, the program here or the way that they do this. And so when you get into, like you were talking about, I think this is especially highlighted in smaller churches, rural churches, right. like you, you just can't compete with that. Like there's, there's nothing that, that we can do here in York, Nebraska, that's going to compete with say you, uh, Lincoln Berean in Lincoln, right. which is a, a huge church. And I got nothing against them. Like they've got gospel centrality. They just have more resources and uh, more, uh, whether that's monetary resources or people resources or whatever, to be able to do stuff like that. And what I see in the Bible over and over again is just these three principles, like gospel centrality, simplicity, and excellence. Like the church is not complicated. The church is simple, not simplistic, but simple. So our teaching should be simple. It shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't have all sorts of barriers of complexity that rob the message of the gospel from its power. So something to to keep in mind is whatever you you get people with, you have to keep them with that same thing. Yep. And as the, as the church grows um, in a local context, you don't want to have people there who were you got but through um, a big ordeal or a big program um, where the gospel wasn't the central point of what you were doing. You want to attract people. To the gospel. If the gospel is the power of God to change people and to transform people, then that's that's got to be the center of every one of our ministries because that's what we want to get people with. Yeah. Because that's the only thing that we're going to keep them with. If you get them with the elaborate building of this uh, of a program, the only thing that's going to keep them is if you do a bigger and better program and you continue and you continue and then it becomes more complicated and more complex and harder to do well uh, the bigger it gets. But it's it's feeding into that consumer mentality. Yeah. And we need to be careful to to not build our structures and our ministries around the that model. Yeah. Because that's not sustainable and it's actually not transforming your community or your people in any way if you're attracting people with um, the program itself. Yeah. So one of the examples of that is like, you kind of get, uh, Easter, um, Easter is like, just take those big holidays, like the, the, the big church holidays, Easter and Christmas. Um, there's this, there's this pressure that I think everybody kind of feels, but maybe you want to acknowledge that, man, we need to be doing something spectacular for Easter, or for Christmas. I mean, we need to have something extra. And those things might be helpful. Like there might be things that you can do that are extra or outside of the ordinary. We'll just call it that. Uh, that might be helpful, but are, there's, there should be guiding principles to keep those things from getting out of control and detracting from the main purpose of doing it in the first place. So if we're keeping gospel centrality, we're keeping the principle of simplicity and we're keeping the, simpl- the principle of excellence in the forefront what it does is it sort of provides guardrails or barriers or boundaries to keep these things from taking on a life of their own and then becoming these all consuming things that are actually counterproductive to the mission of what we're actually created them for in the first place. Right. Um, so one of the things that we will just use as an example uh, is Sunday morning worship service here at Arbor drive. Uh, it, when I look at, when I look at the Bible um, I, I see worship services as incredibly simple. I mean, what do you do? You pray, you preach, you sing, you have fellowship, you have the Lord's Supper. Um, those are the sort of the elements that are included in the Re- Sunday morning worship service. I would say um, reading. Reading, yeah, reading the Bible, having scripture reading. Um, so those are sort of the, the five or six elements that are included in the worship service. Beyond that, we don't get a lot of instruction, but what we see is the more complex we make that, the more it detracts away from the message of the gospel, which should be central to the worship gathering. Um, and on the other side of that, if we don't do it with excellence, in other words, by that we mean like we prepare and we have, it's well thought out. And even things like in our worship service transitions, making sure that the transitions don't take away from 
uh, from the, um, the flow of the service, making sure that they, that one part of the service feeds into the next part of the service. So there's, there's continuity, which requires some, some thought and some planning and some, uh, some training and some, uh, encouragement with people involved in the service, like making sure, uh, that there aren't things that are distracting that, that come about, like, we're going to make mistakes. Like we're not saying like we're professionals or anything, but what we're saying is that we try to think things through and plan so that there's a, there's a, there's a, an attitude of what we're doing really matters and is really important. And we want to do it the best we can because we want to honor God with our talents, with our gifts in preparing for this and in whether it's preaching or running sound or running um, or greeting or whatever it is that's involved in that Sunday morning service, we want to do that the best we can. Um, and so those three things, what, what that's led to is that's led to a very simple service, not simplistic, but simple. We don't have like a lot of flashy stuff. We've got a, a band that right now does not have a drummer and we're okay with that. Like if the, one of the guys that um, was well, the guy really that played drums, Mark, he, he moved to Lincoln and we haven't had anybody that's been able to fill that role yet. And so we just do it without that. It's yeah. like, Oh, okay. That's okay. You know, like if we're, if we're making it complex and we're saying we have to have this in order for this to be successful, then what we're doing is we're jumping through hoops, trying to find somebody to play drums and maybe they, maybe they're willing to do it, but they're not ready to do that yet. Mm -hmm. And then that ends up taken away from the excellence and is a distractor. And it's really complicated because you've got all these moving parts now that, that, you know what I mean? And then what all of that does is takes away from the gospel message and the centrality of the gospel in the worship service. And so what we want people to see when they come to worship with us at Arbor Drive is Christ. We want him, we want them to see him in the songs that we sing. We want them to see him in the prayers that we pray. We want to see them to see him in the fellowship, in the reading of the text, in the preaching, in all of those different elements. We want Christ to be magnified and exalted. Um, so that's sort of how that plays out for us in one area of ministry. I think churches try to, the, and you got to be careful because you want to leave room for people to grow into a gift set yeah. if they've got it. So you got guys that have a desire to in, within your church to preach or to go into ministry. You've got to have an avenue for that to happen. But it yeah. doesn't mean that you have to compromise the excellence piece of that either. It may not be to the same quality of which if it's somebody new trying to trying it out, it may not be the same quality as your regular preacher, but is he still gospel central? Is he still doing um, a quality job? Um, it might look a little different or it might have rusty pieces to it or pieces that you can tell where someone's uncomfortable as they step into that role. And it could be, it could be preaching. It could be exhortation. It could be leading um, in song. It could be just oh, somebody who's playing an instrument. Um, it could, it could be, manifest itself in a lot of ways. Um, but do people grasp and value the principle of excellence yeah. uh, throughout your services or throughout your ministries. Um, so, and that's a great point and, too. Like the one way, one of the ways that, sorry, I'll, I'll just, just interject. One of the ways in which excellence, <laughs> I interrupt you. You're like, I'm oh, sorry. I'm going to finish what I was yeah. saying. Shut up. <laughs> one of the, one of the ways that excellence can be achieved is okay. If we're gospel central, then that message is being, um, proclaimed and explained again and again and again. Yeah. Um, and as we do that, um, it's going to work. Some of those um, rougher spots should come off. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're using those same, uh, that same message. Um, we're learning to do it in different ways. We're learning to proclaim it in different situations. We're learning to live that out. So as you do that, the more you do it, it becomes more of a natural thing. And it's a simple message. And one of the ways in which excellence comes about is by taking all of the unnecessary um, complexities, complexities yeah. that we try to put into everything and say, okay, is this needed? Does this accomplish um, communicating what we want it to communicate? Or is this something that we're trying to attract people with? Yeah. Because that's consumer thinking is I've got to have this to attract people or I've got to have this piece um, because it's expected. Yeah. Uh, that, that's where we get in trouble because that's when 
simplicity goes out the window and what goes out the window with it is excellence. Mm -hmm. Um, So we can try to be gospel central. And in doing that, we're like, okay, well, I'm going to add all these pieces and I'm going to help tie the gospel in in all all these ways, which can be good if you can make it. But the reality is most, most churches don't have the resources to make that happen. And by overcomplicating, whether it's your worship, worship service or, um, your adult ministry, youth ministry, children's ministries, whatever uh, small group ministries can mm-hmm. do this too by trying to, oh, well, let's theme something throughout the year for everybody to to work on. And it's like, no, get together, gather, talk about scripture together, pray for each other, enjoy each other's company, fellowship. Yeah. That's simple. It can be done well. It can be, it's valuable to people. Yeah. Um. Stop. We get in the, we get into that, that uh, idea that we've got to make these things super complex and, and we lose excellence when we do that. Or we, in the pursuit of excellence, we make things super complex, right? which ends up detracting from the excellence in yeah. the long run. Simple is not bad. Yeah. Simplistic. Yes. That's bad. That's bad. But simplicity doing something that is of, that has high value and doing that well, which is a simple thing. Yeah. That's what we want. To your that, point, that's attractive. To your point, um, because it's focusing on the right things, right? Because we're what we're, we're, we're attracting people with you're is the gospel, to, right? You're trying to attract people's hearts. You don't care about their initially their emotions or um, the things that maybe would um, attract the flesh. Yeah, you want to attract the heart. Yeah, I'm not. And the gospel not message after, is what does that. I'm not after competing with the world to try to entertain. Uh, and that's what we've gotten pulled into. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a, that's a big part of it. And uh, so one of the things that you were talking about, like when, when it comes to preaching, like there are, there are guys that maybe are called to preach that haven't had the experience in preaching yet. And so there's this quote that seems counterintuitive that I love. It's anything that's worth doing is worth doing poorly. And here's what that means. It means that if it's worth doing, it's worth making some mistakes and learning from those mistakes, but it doesn't stay poor. Right. It grows in excellence. And so like even just taking these principles when you're like, say you're training somebody or growing in ministry yourself, because like this, what the beauty of this is we constantly need to be looking for like, are we overcomplicating this or are we not doing this with excellence? So you take something like preaching, you've got a, a guy that, that feels called to ministry that, that feels like he has the gift of preaching or that wants to hone the gift of preaching uh, and needs some experience doing that. The first couple of sermons might not be great, right. but you, what you don't do is you don't just let it sit there. You go and you evaluate it together. You talk about, okay, look, was the gospel clear? Was the structure simple and easy to follow? And did you prepare in a way that allowed you to communicate with clarity? Um, those are those three principles applied. So when when I'm preaching, that's what I'm asking myself. Is the gospel clear? Am I, am I clearly uh, articulating the gospel, how this text relates to the gospel, what the gospel is, things like that? Number two, uh, have I gotten in the weeds of trying to explain every single nuance of every single word and every single text where I've overcomplicated and the message gets lost in that complicated process. And number three, am I presenting it in a coherent fashion that's well thought out and planned so that people can see that I've put some effort into this and it matters to me? Am I communicating it with passion? Has this affected me first? Or am I just sort of like regurgitating the, um, the fruits of my study to others in a cold and different way? Um, I think through things like even like, this is where I want to emphasize. This is where I want to make sure that I, I'm going to camp out here for just a minute to make sure that this is really clear. That's part of the excellence piece that goes into that. Now, I'm by no means uh, have arrived. I don't think anybody arrives, but that's the pursuit. And for me, at least, it comes down to whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. We, we glorify God through the gospel. We glorify God through not depending on our own ingenuity and our own uh skills, our own attractiveness, our own ability to lure and woo people in, but with simply relying on the gospel and and the message. And then we glorify God by doing it the best we can as a servant of Christ Jesus, recognizing that those gifts and the grace of God is active in our lives that enables us to do that with excellence so for I, him. I, was just, I just thought about this as you were talking, but gospel, what we do. gospel centrality should lead 
to simplicity and excellence. Yeah, I think so. The gospel message is simple, but it also proclaims that everything, like you were saying, um, everything you do, including the way you build your, whether you're a sermon builder or you're a ministry builder or you're a worship service builder or just an individual in your life, everything you do, you do to the glory of God. That that's that is the a fruit of the gospel, which means that if we're going to actually live that out, we're going to have simple messages for people, simple ways in which we communicate, simple structures in which we give ourselves opp- opportunities to do that. And we're going to try to do that with to the best of our ability. Yeah. Depending Go- on God's grace the whole yeah. time. To- gospel centrality leads to these two things. Yeah. What winds up happening is we get, we can get be gospel central and then all of a sudden we can just cut off that, that aspect that that's what we need for people the people to see and then we start building stuff yeah. and saying, Ooh, well this this would be really helpful and this would be really helpful. And sometimes those things can be, but if if they're disconnected from your main focus, which is gospel centrality and everything that we do, um, then they're actually you're not leaning on that anymore. You're not yeah. leaning on God's grace. You're not leaning on him. You're not trusting in what he said is true that the gospel is the power of God to salvation, and it's the power of God to transformation. You're not trusting that. You're trusting in your your own ability to build something that you think will be effective. And that's as really, the church is super simple. The church just heralds the message of the gospel and exhorts and encourages one another, speaking the truth and love to build one another up so that we can be equipped to do the work of ministry. That's the church. That's yeah. it. It's simple. And we do those things with excellence. Like Paul says, I like, I worked harder than anybody else yet. It wasn't I, but the grace of God at right. work within me. He didn't just sit back and be like, well, the gospel's power. I'm just going to like, I'm just going to be lazy and, and not make an effort. But he, in his effort, he was relying exactly, back on God's it grace. It was going back to the gospel yeah. for that effort. And so uh, like, and to your point, like in Romans chapter one, it says Paul was set apart for the gospel of God. It's God's gospel. Um, gospel centrality is it comes from acknowledging the fact that we are stewards of this message of salvation and that this message of salvation has a broader application than just the initial act of faith. It, it strengthens and encourages and sustains and keeps and all of the rest of those things that we need. Um, and so gospel centrality doesn't mean that in every text you're only preaching the gospel. Or in every ministry, you're only sharing the gospel. Gospel centrality means that while you're sharing about marriage and God's design for marriage, you're tying it back into the gospel. And you're pointing to the gospel and the grace of God in the gospel and your reconciliation with God through the gospel as the means by which you live and and function in a marriage that honors Christ and points to Christ in the church. You know what I mean? So, um that's where I'm saying it's not simplistic. It's right. simple. Yeah. Um, and so when, when we, when we think about these different aspects of ministry, like really what we're saying is that you and I are finite beings and we really can only focus on a few things at once. So what are those things that are going to, that are going to produce the most fruit because they're relying on God's power and God's grace? Just a couple of examples of where I've seen this um, happen the most um, is with smaller churches and youth ministry and music ministry in particular. Mm-hmm. So you see these big, what look like vibrant um, music ministries on YouTube and in these big churches and you've got the light show and you've got the huge band and it's got tons of people there. Mm-hmm. And so these these smaller churches can look at that, that can be, um, there, a lot of them are unhealthy, but they can say, okay, I want to grow this. And the automatic response to that. And the first thing that we go to is, forms. Okay, we've got to have a drummer. We've got to have a guitar player. Yeah. We've got a piano and a bass player. And we've got to have a bunch of people. We'll sing four part harmonies up there. Mm-hmm. And what inevitably winds up happening is that, okay, who wants to do that? And you'll get somebody that wants to do it. Who's never tried it before in their lives. And then they'll get up and they'll try to do it and you'll put to, and you'll try to do this modern style of music in a context where it's, it may not be appreciated one. People aren't equipped to do it. And people aren't equipped to do it. And you do it really, really badly. Um, 
and I, so I've, I've had the chance to speak with a couple of smaller churches on this. Like m- my exhortation is don't do that. If you are a congregation of 80 or 150 or 300, whatever you are, and all you have is some singers and a piano player, then put that up there. Yeah. Um, use the gifts that God's given you and, and sing hymns or sing modern songs, but do them in a style that, um, it, it works with the people that you have with the gifts that God's given you. Same thing. If you have, if you're a small church and you have all those gifted people, put them up there. Yeah. So it's better um, to do, it, it's better you, to do worship with just one gifted guitarist than it is with a mediocre band. It's better absolutely. to do uh worship with one gifted pianist than it is with one mediocre guitar player. And, that, and the, it's better to do worship acapella than it is to distract by trying to add complexity of instruments. Right. And that doesn't mean that we don't work towards those right. things if we got people that want to do that. But in your effort to do that, don't don't devalue um, your time together worshiping. Um, and the same thing with uh, youth ministries. Cool stuff does not make a youth ministry. It might get you a lot of people there, mm-hmm. um, and big personalities might do that. But the thing that's going to keep and sustain is built upon these these same principles. Do I trust in the gospel and the power to do that? Do I build things that are simple and can um, last over time? And do I do them with excellence? So that means I I pour some time into it. Mm-hmm. I, I pour some time into relationships. Yeah, uh, You don't have to have all these big, bright things that the world tells you you need. Yeah, um, We've got to stop following that model because what— we keep having churches that they, they flux and they go big and then they crash to the bottom and people are, and then people are always fighting to get back to that. Well, it was like that at one point in time. Yeah. And and I agree in it. And there was probably a lot of value in that, but it wasn't a sustainable uh, model for most churches because you just don't have the resources to do that. And this is the beauty of this. These principles is they're scalable. If you have a larger church, you apply these same principles right. If you have a small church, you apply these same principles. And so in, in the flux of church life, it's adaptable to, right. to contextualization and to, and to other things too. And so like, I, like when we went to the, the gospel, uh, or TGC, the gospel, no, it was, uh, together for the gospel T4G. Uh, it's, it's, we've said this before, but it's, um, a piano. And it's Bob Coughlin and it's songs where the lyrics are projected up on the screen. It's just a black screen with white words and a group of people, a group of guys. Now, Coughlin is gospel centered. The, the texts that he reads are gospel texts. The songs that we sing are gospel songs. They point us back to the sufficiency of Christ. They tie into the preaching that's going to happen. They remind us of the truths of the gospel. He's a, incredibly gifted piano player yeah, and incredibly gifted worship leader. And so he's, he's does it with excellence. He, he, and I've seen the Instagram posts of him and Mark Dever planning these things out right. where there's time and energy and effort put into it. There's thought put into the songs and the song selection. And it's like, it doesn't get any simpler than a guy on a piano right. up on a stage off to the side and, and the words on, on a black background. Um, and yet he does it with with excellent simplicity and gospel centrality, and that has been some of the most uh, powerful worship. Not necessarily because there's ten thousand guys singing, but because there's so little distraction yeah. to the message. Yeah, and yeah. even even him being um, a gifted musician that has spent a lot of time and a lot of energy in in, in honing that gift keeps him from detracting from that with trying to do something he's not quite ready to do. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. It makes him adaptable too. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, those are all, as, you, as you're growing your skill, you're, you're growing because you want people to see Christ. Yeah. And you don't want to be a distraction. So you're like, okay, well, I'm going to do um, things that are simple and I'm going to do them with excellence. So, like in that case, the more you grow that skill, the simpler it is for you to do it Yeah, because you can do it so well. So then it's, then it is a simple thing. Yeah. What's complex to somebody is simple to others. So there, there's different ways. And 
you can't just like you can't just put a blanket over right, everybody yeah. and say this is how you do it all the way across the board. But those principles because, matter. But the principles yeah. are what we're talking about. So don't get into the weeds of well, what does that practically look like for me? Because if you're the the church of five hundred is is practically going to look different than the church yeah. for a hundred. Yeah. It just is that that's a reality. But are the the principles have they should always stay the same no matter what size your church is. And they're governing the the ministry, right? So these uh, are also applicable to the individual. I was just well, going to say that. Okay. Like, I had this really good transition that <laughs> is excellent and simple. Uh, but we, we should apply these <laughs> principles to our podcast. We should apply these principles. It doesn't get any simpler than this. It it's doesn't. just, we need to work on the excellence yeah. piece. Um, the, like these three principles, when we talk about ministry, we're not just talking about the church, like gathered or the church as an institution. In fact, we're more often than not talking about the church in the context of individuals outside of the building. So these principles for ministry have application for us in um, our individual lives. So let's just take maybe two things. One, sharing the gospel, and two, um, discipling your kids. Let's just use those two as an example um, because I think they could probably apply broadly to many people. If you don't have kids, if you're a grandparent listening, uh, use them for your grandkids, right? So, or if you don't, have or if kids you don't have yet. kids, use them for kids in your church that you're of kids of your friends or whatever. They'll appreciate it. I promise. I appreciate it when other people speak the truth of the gospel into my kids' lives. So, um, so let's take, uh, let's take those two things. I'll take, uh, I'll take sharing the gospel and, and you take, uh, discipling kids. Uh, and so like when sharing the gospel, a lot of times what we do is first of all, uh, we're not clear on the gospel. Gospel clarity has to be, gospel clarity is essential for gospel centrality. Uh, there's a great book called Gospel Fluency. But gospel centrality also feeds into gospel clarity. Exactly. Is, see how that works? Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a great book I would recommend. It's called Gospel Fluency by Jeff Vanderschlit. And I think I said that right. Uh, and he basically just likens it to a language. Like we should be so fluent in the gospel that we speak it fluently. Mm. Um, just like we're fluent in our mother tongue. And so gospel centrality includes gospel fluency, gospel clarity. We want to know what the gospel is. We want to be able to articulate the gospel clearly in second nature. And so what I mean by that is a lot of times what we look for is we look for a program or a philosophy to share the gospel. So we're like, okay, I need to get them to this place. I need to talk about this. So here's the way I'm going to do that. And, and it becomes this very complex, memorized shtick that you do. And it's, people see through that. They're like, okay, you got an agenda here. I, I get it. Um, and so if we have gospel centrality, that means that everything in our lives, we're looking at through a gospel lens. We, we're able to tie, uh, there's, there's a, uh, Chris Hughes, I think read a book recently, uh, turning ordinary conversations into gospel conversations. I really want to read that because I think the premise is something that I've been saying for a while. And that's like anything that we talk about, can relate back to the gospel somehow. We can we can draw that into a gospel conversation, no matter what it is. So, gospel centrality then is looking for points of application, points of context between whatever we're talking about, whether it's sports or whether it's kids or whether it's family or life or whatever, to the gospel. So that's gospel centrality. You have simplicity, which means that when I'm communicating the gospel, I'm communicating the simple truths of the gospel. I'm not getting sidetracked with the weeds of all sorts of different things that we might grow into and we might, we might grow in our understanding of over the years. But I mean, when, when Paul shares the gospel, um, when Peter shares the gospel, it's just the simple truths of the gospel that are articulated. And then the excellence piece comes in with like, I've actually thought about how I'm going to share the gospel. I've thought about this enough to where I can, I can communicate this, clearly. I can articulate this with passion because it's affecting my own heart. I'm, I'm able to, um, to relate to this person in a way that is not following some canned thing, but actually showing genuine concern for them and their soul. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm impassioned about it. I'm not just like this passive, like, well, I guess I got to check this box here. I'll share the gospel with you. Da, 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 da. I did it simply. I was gospel central, but there wasn't a sense of urgency. There wasn't a sense of of passion. There was no excellence behind it. 
Um, and so I think that those three principles, even in our conversations that we have with other people can transform the way that we share the gospel with them because it's just liberating. It's freeing us from these, these sort of ideas that we've had in our head where I need to be trained. I need to have, I need to have a process for sharing the gospel right. and those things might be helpful at times, but ultimately if you have gospel centrality, if you have simplicity, if you have a commitment to excellence where you're like, I'm going to communicate this the best that I can as simply as I can with the, with staying centered on the gospel and not getting sidetracked from that, that God honors that. Um, and, and he uses that in amazing ways and everybody can do that. And you continue to grow yeah. in your, in that, like if you're, if you're gospel central and, and you're working in gospel fluency, that's, that's excellence that you're working at yeah. and it builds on itself. And the more you do it, it's just, you find, you simply find ways. Well, Hey there, I can interject there. I can interject there. And it's just a, it becomes a reflex yeah. versus um, something that that's forced. To, so part to of the happen. excellence piece then is, is equipping yourselves in areas of your own weakness to be able to more effectively share yeah. the gospel. Gos- that's why, that's share. why yeah. I say gospel centrality leads us into yeah. excellence. Exactly. Because the gospel is a simple message. And the more that we, we uh, meditate on that and we, we bask in that, in that message and in those truths and we glory in Christ, the the more excellent it, it becomes when we open our mouths yeah. because it's just part of who we are. Yeah. Um I think I would say I don't think it changes very much for our kids. Um other than I would I would just add one thing. So I think um I think what you talked about where um looking for every opportunity, every moment. So um you said this a couple months ago, but we are discipling in every yeah. in everything that we do. Yeah. Um so seeing that Every conversation that I have with every person, including my children, um, even when we're talking about butterflies or we're talking about homework, discipline or homework whatever. or whatever it is, is an opportunity to disciple yeah. towards Christ or away from Christ. So as you're, as you're doing that, I think one of the things that trips us, us, trips us up more than anything is that we think that we, we have to get out. I need to get the character of God and the character of man and the fallenness of man and then what Christ has done and that he's been resurrected and he ascended to the Father and uh, I have faith and repentance. I need to get all of that out in one setting, and it's got to be clear and concise. And uh, I got to make sure that you understand it, that you understood every piece uh, yeah. of that that I said. And I think with our kids, um, repetition's important, right? But also take the opportunities that are, um, you're given um, when they see something cool in creation to point out God's character and how yeah. and God's goodness um, as he, he made all these beautiful things. When um, when we're in discipline or we see somebody, uh, another kid do something um, they shouldn't do and, and we bring that up, help, help the, um, them to connect that to um, the fallen nature of man. Yeah. Um, when they see um, something like, okay, so my kids on a TV show, they, they saw a person like uh, came out of the water and they revived them, mm-hmm. um, right? And, and, okay, what did Christ do for us? Yeah. Um, if we believe like there's all kinds of these little, these little pieces throughout our lives in the normal things that we do in the normal rhythms of life, especially with our kids. If, if we're gospel central, um, and, and we understand that, that they just need simple truths, uh, and built up on top of each other again and again. Um, it's really, it's really, I think it's a really easy thing to do them in an excellent way. Don't let the complexity of, I need to get all the truths out at one time, every time yeah. that I share the gospel with my child, I think that's the, that can be the wrong way to do it because we just overload them mm-hmm. with things that they can't grasp other than, rather than just giving them pieces, pieces of the gospel. And helping them to connect those pieces over time. And it's also yeah. trusting that God's going to use those things yeah. instead of, I've got to say this perfectly and, and fully every single time with yeah. my kids. So It's just liberating, be- man. It's It really is. It takes the... It puts the it puts the pressure on God to work, and it puts the responsibility on us to trust that and to be faithful. Right, and um, and it's like, do do you really believe that the gospel saves people, mm-hmm. or do you believe that it's the way you communicate the gospel yeah. that saves people? Yeah, um, I I really think it's just getting ourselves out of the way. Yeah. Um, and the, the method of ministry. Cause I think, and, and at, I wonder at times if we just think, think this is too simple, I've got to 
make it a little more, I've got to add a little yeah. bit to make it more appealing yeah. um, to people. And that's where we get tripped up. And that's when we get out of this, um, where we over, we just overdo on all of the extra things and we make it complicated when it's really, it's a simple message that has a simple truth and we need to rely on God to do the work and not ourselves. Or, or the complexity comes because we're trying to spice it up because we think it's not entertaining enough right. or it's not powerful enough. And, and just one, one thing to add to what you were just saying is the beauty of the gospel is gospel centrality leads to, uh, the simplest communication of the gospel. Like you were saying, like, it's so simple that a child can understand it and grasp it and believe it, but it's so complex and so limitless that you can never reach the depths of it. It's, it's an abyss. Mm -hmm. And so if you have gospel centrality, you're always going to be growing. You know, you, you don't arrive like you don't like, Oh yeah, I get the gospel now and there we go. I'm good to go. I'll move on to the next, I'll move thing. on to the next thing. Cause you never outgrow the gospel. It's just what you end up seeing is you see these other things through the lens of the gospel and it deepens your appreciation of the gospel and expands your understanding of the word of God because it's, it's all communicating his message of redemption and salvation and who he is and what he's done for us in Christ. And so, so that, that do yeah. not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your, your mind is renewed through the message of the gospel, which yeah. is communicated through the words in scripture, which are all pointing us to Christ and that message. Yeah. So that, that transformation or the, um, that, that conforming into his image, those things happen through simply looking to the word of God and relying on him and that, that having that gospel centrality in our lives, um, stop complicating it. Yeah. Cause I think that's what we tend to do when we, we think how oh, I'm going to add a little bit to this and all we're adding is crap dust yeah. to everything when we, when we think that way. Yeah. So, and the, the, like, even when I say this and shut up, I was just thinking while you were, while you were saying that, like, even when we're talking about um, all scripture pointing to Christ, like not every single text is explicitly talking about Christ, sure, yeah. but every single text is revealing something about God and his character, which Christ is God in the flesh. And so, um, when we're doing gospel centrality, we're doing the same thing. Like not every text is explicitly a gospel text or not explicitly telling us the gospel, but there's elements of the gospel. Like you were talking about with our kids, there's elements of the gospel in every part of the Bible. And so when we, when we have that gospel centrality, we're looking for that and we're, we're coming back to that. So cool, man. All right. Well, that's, that's the most simple, excellent gospel centered podcast we could come up with right now. So maybe we're not the best. <laughs> <laughs> best models for this, but at least like we really do. We really do believe that this is uh, the principles that need to be governing the church um, that we've strayed away from the simplicity and excellence and, and gospel centrality that I think the early church had uh, that the apostles had that, that the Bible is pointing us to. So, yeah. So just don't get stuck in those. Th and like, I think people there, there's good models to yeah. follow. Um, so if you've got, if you got a model down that maybe is a little more complex that you can do with excellence and it's gospel centered, go for it. But I just think that too many people look at those models and say, that's really successful. Yeah, I, I need do to that. do that. Yeah. And pragmatism, baby. Yeah. That's, that's the wrong, if that's the goal is, um, I want to get more people. I think that's, that's something that I've seen a lot lately. And even in myself, like we'll have a a worship service where we'll be down a hundred people from normal. Right. Yeah. And like, I'm like, well, maybe I just won't put the, quite the effort in. Aww. Yeah. And that and like in myself, like that's, that's a pathetic way to think about it. As, like, I've, I've struggled with that too. Like, um, oh man, there's nobody in here there's, today. But there, this there, is a really important text. Right. <laughs> yeah, why aren't you here? Why aren't you here this? for this? This is really, this is legit. Like I put a lot of effort in it. Right. Like, and, and it's, yeah, it, and that's, so we struggle with it too. Right. Like we're, this is not something where we, we, these are things that we're applying in our own lives even. So cool. Well, we'll be back next week. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the end. That was an abrupt ending. The end. The end. Okay. <laughs> All right, so hopefully you will join us then for the next episode of the Pastor Discussions Podcast, your weekly conversation on doctrine, faith, and the Christian life.